Hey guys, welcome back to Big Strong Book. I'm Reed, and today we are going to be discussing Shards of Honor by Lois McMaster Bujold. Now, this book says uh, Cordelia's Honor, and that's because Shards of Honor is the first of two books collected in this omnibus edition. The second novel is Barriar, uh, which I will be reading next and reviewing uh, hopefully within the next few days, certainly within the next week. Um, so this is my first time reading any of the Vorkosigan saga novels. Uh, Shards of Honor is the first published in the series, and in terms of the overall chronological order of the story, it is my understanding that this is the second novel chronologically, but uh, I am choosing to read Shards of Honor first because the novel that precedes this chronologically, a novel called Falling Free, I believe takes place 200 years before Sh Shards of Honor, and it doesn't really have close relation to the events of the primary saga. Uh, so I will hopefully, you know, if I... If I really enjoy this series moving forward, I should get to uh, reading the novel Falling Free uh, further down the line, but I'm not sure. Uh, we'll see on that. But anyway, as I mentioned, Shards of Honor is the first novel published, uh, and I know most readers, if they're reading in chronological order, they'll start with Shards of Honor. Uh, Shards of Honor and Barry are also precede a good chunk of the story, but, and I, I know that this isn't really spoilers, uh, this next bit, because it's something that, you know, you look up any article about the Vorkosigan saga or anything like that, and you'll see that most of the narrative, most of the novels, novellas, short stories within the saga concern, uh, a man named Miles Vorkosigan, and he is the son of Cord Cordelia Naismith, uh, later Cordelia Vorkosigan, and Errol Vorkosigan. Um, the, the novel Shards of Honor essentially is how Cordelia and Errol meet. Uh, so I know that this book takes place about 17 or 18 years before the first Miles novel, uh, which is called The Warrior's Apprentice. And I just want to kind of start by saying right off the bat, I really enjoyed this novel. Uh, this is one that, you know, if I had to give it a starred, an X amount of stars out of five, I would give it, it is a strong four out of five. But even, you know, so I finished this book yes, yesterday, and, you know, in, in thinking about it a little bit in the day or so since I finished it, I've started to already appreciate it more. Because for anybody who watches a YouTube video on the Vorkosigan saga or reads about it online, you know, you're, you're certainly going to see a lot of praise for Bujold's mastery of characterization, character development, situational dialogue, and all of those great things, in addition to crafting a pretty interesting uh, political narrative and story, which Shards of Honor um, eventually becomes, which isn't what I was expecting this novel to turn into. Uh, I know a lot of the gripes that people will have with Shards of Honor primarily concern the romance aspect of the novel because, as I mentioned before, this is the novel about how two significant characters, significant because they are the parents of what whom, whom many consider to be the protagonist of this entire saga, um, it's about how they meet. I... You know, the, the romance wasn't as necessarily as overt as I was expecting in this novel. Um, it's almost more understated 
for about 70%, and then it becomes more overt after the 70% mark. But it felt natural. Uh, I thought it did. I mean, I know that this is that's probably the point that a lot of people disagree on about this book is the romance. Was it too um, convenient or anything like that? I, I really don't think it was. Um, so I'll, I'll get I'll get in here into a little bit about kind of the, the plot of the book as it opens. Uh, so as I mentioned, the really the, the 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 if you were to pin this novel down to one singular protagonist, that protagonist would be uh, Commander uh, Cordelia Naismith, uh, and Cordelia is from a planet, a uh, beta colony. That is kind of her government. Is She's a, a Baton, and she is part of the Baton Expeditionary Force, and they're doing some surveying of these star systems and, and of, of planets within them. And, you know, they're even though they, they are prepared when they go into these places to be prepared for potential violence, I mean, because they're, they're, they're going into these, they're the expeditionary force, they're going into these planets, into these systems, not fully knowing what to expect. They're, I mean, right with Cordelia is um, uh, Dubowner, and Dubowner is a, he's a, a botanist. So there's, you know, a, an altruistic, a scientific aspect to the missions that Cordelia um, is going into. And this novel opens uh, with kind of a, a skirmish, uh, one that Cordelia does not witness, but happens upon. Um, and that skirmish is her expeditionary force, members of her expeditionary force, being ambushed by um, members of a Baryan force. So then that leads to, you know, a digression within the book as we see these other characters. So we learn that they're of the many civilizations, of the many governments, of the many planets within the Vorkosigan world, or the world of this huge narrative. There's Beta Colony, and there's also a planet uh, called Beriar. And the 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 uh, Beriarian or the Beriarin, not exactly sure if it's Beriarian or Beriarin, uh, the Beriarin Empire. Uh, they're very, they're a very militaristic, uh, kind of warrior culture, and they're they're very feudalistic too. There are lords, there are counts, and they are led by an emperor. Uh, and this ambush that happens upon the, you know, with the Beta Expeditionary Force uh, is led by Captain Errol Vorkosigan, and his ship is the, the General uh, Vorcroft or uh, Voscroft. Um, but, I mean, the, the exact name of that ship, it's not super uh, pertinent to the, the story, but... As Cordelia happens upon them, Vorkosigan is there, and Vorkosigan kind of hits uh, Dubowner, or somebody else hits Dubowner, the botanist, with a nerve disruptor. And so he's still alive, but he, his nerve motor function isn't uh, all there, and, and, and his cognition as well is um, kind of poor. But uh, Cordelia's ship was able to escape, along with the rest of her crew. And Vorkosigan is the only Baryon there. And he suspects, and Cordelia begins to, or she kind of puts the pieces together and, and believes, as does, as I mentioned, uh, Errol, that there was a mutiny. And he was, that Vorkosigan himself was ambushed and stranded on that planet as his, um, there's a, a man named uh, Radnoff, who Vorkosigan believes instigated uh, the mutiny because Rat, 
uh, Radnov has been looking for command of his own and believed that this was the opportune moment uh, to kind of sabotage them. But there is a little more um, involved for why the Baryans are there, why they're on this planet. It is not simply for a convenient location um, to just kind of get rid of Orcos again. Uh, there is a a much more, I wouldn't necessarily say sinister at first. It certainly becomes sinister as the novel progresses when you learn the full scale of this conflict, but I'll get into that in a little bit. So essentially, Vorkosigan and Naismith, Cordelia and Errol, and Devouner as well with them, they have to just kind of trek through the jungle, trek through this world. Uh, Vorkosigan believes that there's kind of a point that they can get to. And so, I mean, Cordelia is Errol's captain or c captive. Um, and I think that's that might be the holdup that a lot of people have with the romance aspect is because when they first get to know each other, there is kind of a... I don't necessarily want to say a triggering power dynamic, but certainly a one that could, you know, an, an Errol as as her as her captor, you know, and we see it later in the book where it differentiates Errol Vorkosigan from other Barians, other Barians who have captives and who take advantage of them. And Errol doesn't. You know, even though Cordelia is Errol's captive at the beginning, there's a mutual respect that they have for one another. You know, they're both in their 40s. They're both, you know, single. They don't have a lot of family or immediate family attachments. I mean, Vorkosigan has his family, which he does describe kind of these political um, purges that white, that killed his mother, that nearly killed his father and himself. Uh, Cordelia does have a mother and a, and a brother for sure, but um, again, they, they start to, as they make this trek um, through this unknown world, they begin to understand the similarities that they have in terms of their standing with their own world, with their own society. Um, obviously, the concept of honor uh, takes center stage within this book, what honor means, how honor looks, you know, like, is honor something that can only be exacted with individuals that you are politically linked to, or, you know, society, from a societal aspect, people that you are linked to from a societal aspect. Like, uh, can a, um, a person from Beta Colony only be honorable? Can they only expect, can one only expect them to show honor to somebody from Beta Colony? Likewise, um, a Barian, can they expect to only show honor towards somebody from Barriar? And that, could, that, that, again, that comes into play um, a lot, and particularly at the beginning, because Errol Vorkosigan, he is known as the Butcher of Komar. He is known as this almost brutal military leader. And you learn that, of course, you know, these rumors that are perpetuated about anybody, there might be a sliver of truth there, but it isn't the whole truth. And Errol divulges this to Cordelia. And again, as I mentioned before, they realize that they are quite similar in temperament, in their ethics. And it makes this unknown journey easier for both of them as they become, throughout the novel, as they become entangled in this political game and this war game as well, because you know, kind of the conflict at hand devolves into a a full-out war between 
uh, between governments, between one empire to another government. And again, I, I, I'll, I'll talk about spoilers here in a little bit, um, but I do want to generally talk about just the character development. Um, again, as I mentioned, Cordelia and Errol, they find themselves time and again almost trapped as pawns of a higher government. Cordelia is a member of the Bait and Expeditionary Force. Later on in the book, she is kind of leading a war charge as in, in an, almost a saboteur um, role. And Errol as well, I mean, I, I, was, I was not anticipating how his story progresses and where, I mean, where he ends up at the end the role that he fulfills as a figure, almost truly as a pawn, in a very deeply mired political game. And they're both pawns, one could argue. I think I would make that argument that Errol and Cordelia are both pawns, and that links them. The fact that they are pawns of these governments that one could argue, I mean, do care about them and do need them, but it's the honor that they must find within what they're doing. Like, honor is the thing that at the end of the day that they are fighting for beyond just the simple political causes for Beta Colony or the political causes for Barriar. It's honor for the common man, for the common woman, honor for each other. That's, I mean, that's what this whole book is about. It's, you know, it's honor for one another besides the, the, the political trappings, besides the society. It, I mean, Bujold, she certainly strives to kind of reach that, that universal. But it's, you know, the, as the respect for Errol and Cordelia goes through the narrative as they both undergo pretty dark and twisted traumas throughout this narrative. Um, they are forever bonded. I mean, in more ways than one obvious. And it's, again, it's a non-spoiler that as the Vorkosigan saga continues, uh, they, you know, this is a, there is a, a, a romance aspect. It is kind of about them not only building a mutual respect and bond, but it is also a bond of affection and a bond of love. And the power dynamics that I mentioned before where, you know, and I mean, we see it in our, in our own world where, you know, usually men in positions of power kind of use that power to just to assault women, to, to take advantage of women. That's, that's, you know, unfortunately, that that's that's a part of the entertainment industry. It is the, a part of politics, it, and it's terrible that it's a part of it. And this novel explores that both, as I mentioned, with other Barians. That other Barians are much more invested in this this power game, this this game of abuse and assault and power, and others. And again, when Cordelia and Errol's relationship from an outsider looking in, again, people start to question for Cordelia when she talks kind of around her captivity with Errol. And when they're like, so you were his captive, like, and they're, they're confused as to how she's talking about Errol so, form so informally that she's calling him by his first name, that these feelings that she has towards him are not what one would expect from uh, somebody who was her captor, but again, their, the relationship that they built was so more complex. It did start as he was her captor and she was the captive, but it, it really changed as, again, there, there are ambiguities within these, this character development. There are ambiguities within all of these situations that the characters find themselves in, and that, that is something that is so fascinating. 
And that, I think, I think I understand after reading this book, the praise that people have for Bujold's mastery of characterization and of building these situations. I mean, this could very well for me be a five-star read. I gave it a four out of five, and that, that's what I truly believe this book is at least. But already, I mean, as, and as I'm speaking about it now, already, just as I'm really becoming invested in these characters and thinking back to Cordelia and Errol and all these great things, it makes me really excited to explore the rest of this series and to know that Shards of Honor, it, it's, it's just, it is quite literally just the tip of the iceberg of this saga and as the rest of the saga unfolds, I'm really um, looking forward to seeing where this goes. So, and again, so Shards of Honor, I would recommend looking into getting these omnibus editions while they are out of print, um, at least in terms of getting a physical copy. Uh, I was able to find this book, I believe, for only like $5 on Amazon. So it is well worth, it is, you know, worth every penny. Um, there are maybe six omnibus editions that collect 12 of the 16 novels. So I would recommend looking into that. Again, Shards of Honor by Lu Lois McMaster Bujold has my highest recommendation. Uh, so I'm going to get into some spoilers for Shards of Honor now. So spoilers from here on out. So you've been warned. Um, so as I mentioned with the way that those power dynamics unfold... Uh, and with uh, 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 Vorature, Vorature, and oh my gosh, that scene where Cordelia, where her her ship is kind of taken in on the tractor beam, and she is she's going to be raped, and she's going to be raped by Sergeant. Uh, Bathari, who, who comes in and, and then he kills Voriatur, and I just, I was so captivated by that scene, that scene was so haunting, and again, you, and I think it, it seeks to, Bujold seeks to underline Errol's honor by contrasting him with his peer, his peer is this truly a perverted, a brutal, a terrible human being. And it, it was just, it, it was almost, it was riveting and it was terrifying at the same time to read that section. And, you know, I in that, that feeling extends to later on, kind of after the war, and I will get into the war here in a bit, my God, um... But at, when Cordelia eventually returns back to Beta Colony and the president presents her with this medal for killing Voyager, and she takes it and she's, you know, they, they've written a speech for her to give to all these, you know, the people of Beta Colony. And she takes the medal off and she throws it down and she's like, I shouldn't be getting a medal for this. And she's like, I didn't even kill him. But there, you know, there is a narrative that the government seeks to place on people like her because they, they understand what kind of a political pawn and the president's press secretary almost tells Cordelia, like, you will be great for this administration. She's so, and rightly so, horrified by this and that she has to break through because she and Vorkosigan, they are the only people that understand, pardon my French, but just how fucked their collective governments are, how the world around them is so messed up that it's almost like they are the only two people that can see that common ground with each other. And that's why the romance works for me, because of course they understand this, going through all of these things both separately and together. They understand this. Um, and when it, when it's eventually revealed 
the true purpose of kind of the war between Beriar and Escobar. And when Vorkozigan confesses to Cordelia that he was a pawn for the emperor to assassinate the prince and, and, and take out a couple other members. And he's like, the, this political game, he hates playing this political game. But he ha and he, he's kind of forced into a corner. He has to go along with it. He has to goad the prince into wanting to go out onto the front line and for the prince to die. For Kozigan participates and becomes a part of that. And ironically, and perhaps this is so fitting for Errol, in his character development within this novel, when at the end, he has to become regent. The emperor is dying. And this little kid is going to be emperor after the current emperor, Vor, you know, Vorbara dies. And so he, he is forced to be in a political game that he knows is fucked, essentially. He knows it is, but he has to be involved in it. And it's almost as if he can't trust anybody else in this role, so he has to be in it himself but he can build his own staff. He can have Bathari, he can have Kudelka be a part of his staff. And at the end of the day, he and Cordelia, who be, as, they, as they get married and she becomes Lady Vorkos again, they have each other's backs, you know, in, in, this, in this crazy messed up universe that they, are, that they find themselves in, they can lean on each other and they know that. And as I've mentioned so many times before already, that's why the romance in this book works for me. It makes sense. After all that is said and done, by the end of this narrative of Shards of Honor, that makes sense. And now I'm just, I'm super excited to read Barriar now because it won the Hugo. I just, I've heard it is so good. It, a lot of people consider it to be even better than Shards of Honor. So I'm like, man, you know, this, a novel that, it's going to be even better than Shards of Honor. I can't wait. Um, so yeah, that kind of, I think that's a good place to kind of wrap up uh, my initial thoughts and my initial review of Shards of Honor. Again, one half of this omnibus called Cordelia's Honor. So if you have read Shards of Honor, or if you are a newcomer like me to the Vorkos Against Saga, uh, let me know what you think, and I will see you guys next time.